Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're talking about everything we need to know about guardian angels. Yeah, we're going to answer all your questions about the guardian angels, like who gets them? When does your guardian angel get assigned to you? What happens to your guardian angel when you die? And some other interesting things like what types of people actually have two guardian angels? And did Jesus have a guardian angel? Angel of God, guardian dear, be with us and guide this Reflection and our show today. All right, guys, it's good to be back in the studio with you. Uh, still missing you guys, but it's good to be back with you on Zoom. I'm looking forward to hashing this out because I think guardian angels is a topic that I'm not very well versed in. And, and you've posed some questions there that are kind of intriguing. Yeah, this is one of the episodes that our listeners have asked us to do so many times. Now, we've done an episode on angels more in general, but today we're talking specifically about the guardian angels and the church is teaching on them and how they intercede on your behalf. Uh, the church has a long history of venerating the angels and particularly the guardian angels. And it even goes back very strongly to the Old Testament and to the Jewish people and their beliefs in the angels and guardian angels. So we're going to get into all of that today. And this is going to be a really cool episode. I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy this because they've been asking for it. There have been a number of authorities throughout the years and mystics that have accounted for angels. I'm thinking Padre Pio and many of the other mystics. And, you know, as, as you kind of referenced before, like who gets two angels? That sounds really interesting. And uh, I think you're going to like that, the answer to that one. I, I think I will like the answer. I, I think yeah. I know the answer too. I think you do. But, you know, you have to, you have to look at the authorities, right? And, and one of the initial authorities that we have to look at is Scripture. So, you know, as, as Ryan Shield just mentioned, you know, there is a scriptural tradition, Old Testament and New Testament, as it relates to the angels. So that's a great beginning. The Acts of the Apostles has a number of references as well. But for, for uh, you know, reflection on, on theologians throughout history, I don't think there has ever been a greater theologian or intellect that has tackled a theological structure better than St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas in his first book, in his Summa, speaks emphatically and thoroughly about angels. So we highly recommend his resource uh, to go as deep as you possibly can. And then to always turn to the catechism for your initial first step. So as we take our first step in the show, I'd like to reference Catechism Part 1, number 336. From its beginning until death, human life is surrounded by their watchful care and intercession. This is speaking of the guardian angels. So surrounded by the watchful care and intercession of our guardian angels, beside each believer stands an angel as protector, as shepherd, leading him or her to life. Already here on earth, the Christian life shares by faith in the blessed company of angels and men united in God. And that, you know, starting out with that, we can already see properties and qualities of intercession or involvement in our life as it relates to that. And, you know, we started with the prayer that that guardian angel prayer that many of us were instructed in early on in our life, possibly by a parent or maybe a CCD teacher. But to reflect on those properties, angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here ever this day be at my side. So we see that accompaniment to light, to guard, to rule, and guide. So these are some of the properties initially that we're going to assign to angels. And I look forward to breaking open this episode and really start to reflect on, you know, what angels do in our lives. Yeah, I, yeah you, I, when I look at it, like I, I look at like the um, <clears throat> like spiritual order. You know, like the or the like how God orders creation uh, spiritually and and physically, how it manifests itself in such great order. I, I I'm sort of a pragmatist myself, but uh, but the order of 
you know, the liturgy and, and the order of, of the, the spiritual structure that God created and uses for his glory uh, to me is a very wondrous thing. And so that, that's kind of like how I'm going to be approaching this is like, where does this fit in? Where does, where do guardian angels fit into these, these pieces? You know, well, that's kind of like where my mind According to Aquinas and according to a lot of, you know, doctors and theologians of the church, the archangels, I'm sorry, the, the guardian angels are the lowest tier of angels in the choir of angels. They are the lowest in, I guess, um, uh, just power or, or what it is that God assigns to them in, the, in those nine tiers. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are um, not spiritually powerful, but that it's right. probably because they're likely the most numerous because every single soul is assigned a guardian angel at its conception. And now this is one of those things that, um, you know, when there's a consideration of abortion, you know, do aborted children have um, guardian angels? They certainly do. Cause at the moment of conception, that is when that guardian angel is assigned to you. And that goes for everybody. Uh, and that goes for um, both believers and non-believers. Now, some people basing themselves on scripture will say that only those who are baptized will have a guardian angel and it's assigned to you at your baptism. But that's, of kind of a, a smaller view of the church than what the majority of the church teaches that every single human being at the moment of conception is assigned a guardian angel. So the multitude of those angels would then probably why they are assigned to that lowest tier of the angels because just of their, their sheer numbers. Yeah. Now, yeah. And, Padre, and St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, like he goes into, uh, you know, like the order as, as you're kind of pointing out Delacrosse and what you're saying, Shield too, it's important to realize that there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy in the world, right. Of inanimate, of intellectual beings, of appetitive beings. So even in relationship to an angel being ordered to the good intellectually, there's all different types of levels of intellect of appetite of and and aquinas goes into like really great depth you know beyond our wildest intelligence because aquinas is you know one of those people like you delacross is curious of order right how does this fit in with with the natural sciences how does this fit in with the visible world and we're talking about something invisible what the well the same type of hierarchy of being that we could see very visibly in the world Aquinas starts to really uncover the invisible world in that same type of hierarchy. So what Sheila is saying is, as it relates to the guardian angels being the lowest, it's, it's um, lower in relationship to their uh, total being, being consumed in the presence of God, which would be like more of your archangels, right? And, and St. Michael your and St. Your throne, or your thrones or... Or thrones or principalities, right? I think that is, you're, you're right there, that the higher up you get in the choir of the angels, the more that their uh, soul attention is focused on the beatific vision. Mm -hmm. Because the guardian angels have to be exposed to what is in the world. And at the very crutch of, of where good angels become bad angels, you know, where their appetites are ordered from good to bad, our appetites are inclined towards sin. Our appetites are inclined toward flesh. We're inclined, as St. Augustine would say, toward non-being, or the catechism expresses in line with Thomas Aquinas as well as this concupiscence, that this inc inclination of our, our whole existence as human beings is in this direction of non-being or sin or concupiscence. So what that guardian angel does is right at the crutch of that of, of interplay between the world and the interplay between the demonic forces within the world, the guardian angels are there to order us toward the good, right? And, and I can't help but think of those cartoons, you know, years ago with, with like the good angel and the, and the devil on the shoulder, right? But the good angel, the guardian angel, is to always lead us to the good, right? right. Within the context of the world. Now, that's exactly yeah. what guardian <laughs> angels do. Guardian angels are assigned to all people by God to protect them on the path towards heaven uh, because the, the path of all people is beset on all sides with snares and traps. And that, that guardian angel is there to um, inform you, to intercede for you, to carry your, your prayers to God for you um, and to 
even physically keep you out of harm's way if by doing so it leads to a greater opportunity for your salvation and for your dying in good grace. So, so what exactly is it that a guardian angel does? It's that. It guides you along your way. Now, according to church teaching, that all, the guardian angel also does some other things. The guardian angel, just like we hear uh, in the book of Revelations, that the angels carry your, the prayers of the faithful up to the throne and to the altar of God, your angel will be carrying your prayers. That is almost like a, again, the word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger, right? And it is a messenger of God, but it's also your guardian angel can fulfill the function of bringing your messages to God as well as an intercessor and as a deliverer of your prayers. Also, when you die, your guardian angel is the one that if you die in a state of good grace is the one who will accompany you and carry your soul to heaven to bring you into the vision of God. Um, additionally, if you are dying in a state of grace, your guardian angel will um, try to protect you in that moment from that last temptation of the devil uh, and will do everything to keep you into a happy and holy death. Your guardian angel really is an incredibly important function in your path to the salvation that Christ has won for us. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I think, I, think, I think guardian angels are probably one of the most underutilized uh, spiritual, um, I don't know, assets, I guess you could say. Uh, Amen. Underutilized. Yeah. I said for all, all of us, um, you know, I, I was also thinking too, is that I, I, I bet you that the, that, that the guardian angels also physically protect you from harm in some, in some ways too, as well. They do. Like so again, yeah. So if you, yeah. if they're not like, you know, going to protect you from stubbing your toe, but if they're protecting you from harm in a way that would lead to a greater chance of your sanctification, that's when they would intercede in the physical reality of the world, when they break that veil between the things that are all things visible and invisible, that they would intercede because, again, their job is to shepherd you on that path to heaven. And if, say, maybe uh, you were to die in a state of grace or you were to die in a state of mortal sin and their interaction uh, with your physical well-being could prevent you from dying in a state of mortal sin... Well, that would be maybe an instance where they would intercede physically to protect you. Mm. Got it. You, you know, I think what you were saying, Delacross, and something that I, I consider as well is like um, angels are really not evolved within our relationship, within our Catholic exercise and practice of our faith. You know, when you go into the church, your devotion to Jesus on the cross, because you have a crucifix there, is, is always calling to mind your devotion of the Son of God and, and adoration that's belonged by right. And we know that from the catechism and the teachings of the Catholic Church, that adoration is only due to Jesus Christ, right, as, as Son of God. And then, you know, you start to devoutly, you know, reflect on the intercession of Our Lady, you know, the Blessed Virgin Mary. For some people, that devotion, every time they come into the church, is very apparent. Or St. Joseph, maybe there's a, a statue of St. Joseph in the sanctuary. Or maybe particular saints, or you were named after a saint, like St. Patrick, or, or what have you. You know, you have all of these relationships of all these different saints. You love St. Michael because you're a police officer, and, and you pray to St. Michael before you put on the badge and you go out into the world. Whatever, whatever it may be, those particular... Uh, intercessors are very, very cultivated in the popular culture of our Catholic faith. But one thing that, that is, is, has kind of fallen out of practice in many different respects is the guardian angel. And when I was baptized, one of the gifts that I received was a guardian angel. And I have it right in my room. I look at it every single day and I always reflect on my guardian angel. It's funny because the statue's all busted up and it's got like missing a little bit of his forehead and part of his wings chipped off and you know i've been on it's not easy journey, it's so. not easy following you down the path padre it's really that, not that it's is really a not. perilous journey <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I think it's something you know to consider when you're going to say a a uh, baptism 
or you're looking for a gift for your goddaughter or godson or, or you know, you're asked to be a sponsor, maybe to help uh, the person that you are taking that role and responsibility over to, to buy them a statue of a guardian angel, to encourage them to cultivate a relationship with their guardian angel. Because God ordered that one particular angel for you to look over you, to shepherd you, to guard you, to provide light. And that depends on your devotion and your interaction. You need to evolve in your relationship with your guardian angel. And I, I remember a number of years back going on retreat and even within the culture of Ave Maria University, we had a number of conversations because we were reading a lot of St. Thomas Aquinas as well as a lot of devotional reflections on these saints that, that had these mystical encounters with guardian angels, discerning what is the name of your guardian angel or naming your guardian angel. Um, you know, so these are really, really good practices within the devotional life of the Catholic Church and certainly has to be revived and, and employed a little bit more uh, regularly, I think. Now, I think there's a big debate on whether or not you should name your guardian angel or strive to know its name. Um, me personally, from everything that I've read, that that is not a practice that uh, is generally recommended um, because it is not for a, just like in the Bible where Adam is charged with naming all the animals because he has dominion over them. Um, but that was his given role because he is a higher order and has that dominion. We don't have dominion over the angels. So us trying to ascribe a name to something that we don't have dominion over would seem to me to be a pretty uh, counter spiritual practice based on what we know of, of the order of, of, of the heavens. Now I know that there's the practice I've even read that there used to be a uh, long time ago among the Carmelites, a, a, a practice of trying to discern your angel's name. But I, I think that that could be a dangerous practice, um, a practice that can lead to um, yeah. minimizing your angel or trying to ascribe dominion over something that you do not have dominion over. Yeah. I would with I would, with, I, would, I, would, I would disrespectfully agree, disagree <laughs> with you. I mean, I mean, I mean, I would respectfully <laughs> disagree with you. Um, <laughs> I would disrespectfully disagree with you. <laughs> I'm going to disrespectfully agree with Father Ritz. <laughs> and, and, and here's the reason why. So Michael, St. Michael, the archangel, right? You know, yes. uh, Mikhail, right? Michael, who is like God. It speaks to the property and the very existential nature of disclosure. So discerning the properties and value and existential reality of, of your guardian angel and the disclosure of their, of their name is everything and and when you know many people Ooh. even discerning the name of their of their children you know yeah, it's like you, it's you have proper, dominion over your child you don't have as it's as it is ordered from god so god is ordering this child's existence and giving this existential gift to you that's coming from god and discerning his or her name before God as it relates to the church calendar, for example. Yeah, or, but you have but dominion have you, over your child. You don't have dominion over your angel. Yeah, so. but the authority. The, that, 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 so how is Michael named then? Because he's how revealed is, to Gabriel, us in Scripture. Because they're exactly. revealed to us in Scripture. If God and, wanted and how, our how angels God, revealed to us. How did God choose to inspire Scripture? Through whom? Was it written by angels? Well, it's not through private revelation. Through human beings, correct? But, through, but it's through public revelation and divinely inspired scripture. It's different than private revelation. Were there, I'm going to disagree not with you. Gospels were there not devotional books? Were you know the value yeah, but they're not divinely inspired, things. and those Gnostic books. That's why they're in the trash heap they're, of history. They're, they're, they they have error within them, right? They have right. error within them, and there there is so private revelation also has the ability for error, and naming your angel correct. has the ability for error, which can also bring on you demonic attacks. Uh, just me, most spiritual me, advisors will advise against it. Yeah, and I would, I would lean in the direction of St. Ignatius of Loyola, who would teach you how to discern those spirits, even the spirits of, of darkness that cloak themselves in light. We still have to discern them, right? It's not that we just kind of avoid the battle or we avoid discernment. You know, discerning, discerning comes at the behest of God's revelation. And thank God we have people who wrote scriptures and inspiration down on scrolls and shared testimony so that the church could absolutely enter in and, and to consider, is this inspired? Is this without error? But, but what benefit does by human beings? But by what benefit 
what benefit does knowing the God name bless. of your you angel? See, hold on. We can't miss the opportunity. Can I, when can I call Cross call just mic yes. not working? Is Go my ahead. mic not working? Let's hear what you got to say. You guys, just stop it. I want to explain to you what this is, okay? It's not <laughs> demonic and blah, blah, blah. You with all your little lovey-dovey garbage. I'm going to tell you a story, all right? I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> tell us a story. My daughter, Maria, wanted to name her little brother Hamburger, okay? <laughs> now, does she have that authority? Absolutely not. Was she considering a relationship and naming and all these things as part of a loving way of just addressing a situation where she's going to have a little brother? Absolutely. But the reason why is because she wanted to name him Unicorn after that, okay? So what I think is sometimes, I mean, you can, you can sort of, you know, know that be aware of a presence of an angel and be like, hey, man, you mind if I just call you that? Like as a friend, you know? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, like you're, you're in my life. It could just be between me and you. I'm not going to go out telling everybody I named you like a, like a dog or a cat or whatever. But out of love and respect and my like, you know, my desire to have handles in my life for different things, you're going to get a handle. Is that cool? I and, mean, and the that's, thing not is, a, that's not a, a destruction, a breakdown of the celestial order. And you know, Ava, Ava could call, you know, let's say Vinny Hamburger, right? Yeah. And that that thing can pass on throughout time. And that would be like a sense of like loving endearment between right. Ava and Vinny. And, and down and the year. Just expect my authority to name my children. No, it doesn't. <laughs> He's just an animal. <laughs> and I think it can create devotion and affection and love. And, you know, I just want to encourage any of our listeners who have actually named their guardian angel that you're not going to be duped and going to hell <laughs> by, based by the insights of Ryan Scheel in this regard. So Yeah, well, but your guardian angel is not, not your cat or your dog. Naming your guardian <laughs> angel, he's not your puppy dog. <laughs> Uh, Padre, I'm just going to disagree with you here. And I've encouraged everyone to go and do research on your own. We've broached the subject for you. You, you go look at it on your own because we could do a whole episode on this. But Padre, this is one of those instances where I love you, brother, but I don't agree with you. But that's okay. I think, I think it's due a lot more conversation. And your guardian angel, Unicorn Hamburger the Third, is sad right now. <laughs> no. So actually, now that does bring me to the point is, does your guardian angel get sad when you sin, when you fail in front of it, your guardian angel? Um, you'll, you'll see this often, like, oh, look at my guardian angel seeing me, you know, do whatever, you know, or, you know, you're swearing or you, you know, whatever it is that you do, does your guardian angel cry over that? Does it feel sadness over that? Um, what are you guys' thoughts? Why? Well, I, I know where you're going to. I mean, I just this. look at Does God you, feel? You know, I, I look more at God than I look at, you know, and, and so it's, again, the order starts with God, the triune God and, and, and Jesus. And yes, sorrow for sins. Jesus expressed that. It's one of the sorrowful uh, rosary um, decades, right, that we meditate on is sorrow for our sins. Uh, through that, I think everything is channeled, you know, I mean, like these, these guardian angels are united to God, to the Godhead. And so, uh in that, I think they can be sad, uh, um, and that's that's my answer. What do you think, Padre? Uh, What's your my answer? Uni my unicorn fart says yes. I mean, my unicorn hamburger <laughs> says yes. Did you say unicorn <laughs> fart? See, this is the this is Sorry. the danger. This is the danger of naming your I, angel. I hang out with a lot of little kids. Stop it. Not that my kids say that. Just and all and all the kids who are listening in right now are laughing because you said that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Padre? Did your guardian angel get sad? So you know, I there, this debate goes well within the the debates throughout the centuries of the church, and and it's all the way up to you know affectivity in the in in the Godhead. Is there is there affect in God? Is there affect in spiritual beings that are purely spiritual and angels are purely spiritual? I'm of the school that there is sentiment within spiritual beings 
And, you know, what was it proper to the person of Jesus Christ and his humanity to weep? Absolutely. Did that not transmit into his divinity? It's a mystery. My, my presumption would be that there is a, a crossover between the affect within the humanity of Jesus Christ and his divinity. And, you know, the fact that God had compassion for the waywardness of humanity that he sent out of love for humanity, the gift of his only begotten son, shows me affect. That might just be my, my limited emotional state as, a, as an Italian. But, uh, you know, like I, I definitely, and p- there are people that are led by their heart. So I would come to a, you know, not a concrete conclusion because I'm not omniscient, but I would come to, a, I would come to some type of uh, consideration and, and discernment that, yes, there is sentiment and sadness or affect within well, angelic beings. Let me get, let me give the counterpoint to the Italian Irish and go with the Slovenian French counterpoint here. Um, <laughs> Which means cold hearted to, yeah, to bring it down and they translate are for you. But animals used by the Lord to bring about salvation. <laughs> well, in Matthew 18, 10, which is one of the, one of the biblical references in the new Testament of guardian angels, where he's talking about, uh, you know, not harming children because their angels are always before the face of God at the same time with those, with those children, because they're, they're not bound by corporal reality where they have to be in one location. They could be in the, with the face of God and with their charge, their child at the same time. So there can't be sadness in the midst of the, the beatific vision, which they are continuously faced with. So do your angels, according to that logic, and this is, you know, not my own thoughts, but this is what I've read and the ones that make most logical sense to me is that, that you're right. I do think that they can have an affect of displeasure of your sinning, but they don't feel sadness because any sort of sadness they would feel is completely destroyed by being constantly in the face of the vision of God in person. So in my mind, that's a very valid counterpoint. Yeah. In my mind, so I think we're splitting the difference a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's down to it's down to empathy. So I guess I would. I, can I share a story now, Della Cross? I want to share a story. Hey, let me. You know, let me talk to my daughter. See if it's okay. <laughs> so this is my this is my uh, my story on unicorn fart. What was it? You, oh, hey, come on! <laughs> Don't go there. So well, I'm going to get demonetized. Know, no more unicorn when farts. I, <laughs> when I when I um was blown away by God's mercy and felt the call to the priesthood. I was dating this amazing woman, incredible woman. And, you know, I recall just being so filled with euphoria and, and ecstasy It's probably one of the most incredible experiences of my life being called to the priesthood. And I felt overwhelmed by God's love and his mercy that he would call me to this. And I was just so immersed in that, that, you know, I wasn't feeling the normal feelings of ending a relationship or breaking up with somebody or somebody breaking up with you. Like those, those feelings are not like great feelings, right? And great sentiments. Everything was being consumed by God's love and mercy at that point. So I wasn't feeling bad. I was feeling very much attracted to God to give more of myself and enter more immersively into his, into his love. However, at the same time, empathically, when I would go visit with my, with my ex-girlfriend before I went off to, to seminary, you know, like I felt that as well. So, you know, that, that there could be an empathic sense of Jesus, uh, you know, joining with Mary and Martha at the passing of Lazarus, and that there's a movement of heart in this direction of seeing. Now, Jesus is purely enjoying a, a beatitude before God the Father in a constant sense in his divinity. He's ever before the Father. He is in perfect union with the Father, even when he feels forsaken in his humanity. But at the same time, it's like how Jesus interacts with Mary, Martha, you know, is that just purely in this humanity? 
I, that's 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 hard for me to to conceive of. I'll See, but I think here. I think you're ascribing I, the same qualities to a created angel to the third, the second person of the Trinity, which I don't I don't think they have as a creation. The angel does not have the same well let, let reality let's, as the Trinity. Let's look at this. Let's look at this through that lens. I think it's a good a good point to make and something worth unpacking. Where you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, God wants me to have this empathy towards this person. It, it is the sanctity of my soul. It is, it is the protection of, of a guardian angel to allow me to experience this to, to guide. So, so there, so if there is an affective, uh, affective uh, grace that is, is charged within a person is given to a person that's processed properly through discernment and through God's will right, which is the, the requirement of the guardian angel, that that would somehow be woven into the intellect of the guardian angel, if not woven through the intellect into the affectivity of the, the situation with the person they're entrusted with. And that would, <laughs> and that would be either. Dude, I don't, was this, I don't was this William <laughs> Shatner reading Aquinas? <laughs> there is the affect of the angel with the grace and the, <laughs> Wow. Hey, hey, I don't know what I just said. Hey, listen, I don't know what I, I have just no said. clue what you just said, dude. I really enjoyed saying it. It was great. Um, I am going to set that to music. I'm going to set uh, that to some like nice 60s jazz beat. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I think you might have killed Father Rich. He's bright red. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness oh so, i love you guys i don't man. know does, oh, I love you guys. does your angel so, feel sadness we don't know there's two schools well, and, of thoughts and, you know we there don't is know. Okay. but 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 I, I just want to kind of say too is yeah it depends on faculty right how god creates these angels these angelic beings depends on faculty and how god orders them so yeah and that's and that's what aquinas gets into in hierarchy so i highly recommend that his mind mm -hmm. is is far superior than ours, and and it's a cohesive work. So it's it's yeah. worth reading. It's systematic. If you're interested. Yeah. It's it's very systematic. So it's very very interesting. Uh, you know, ultimately it's a mystery. You know, it's definitely a mystery. I know that if if the bishop doesn't give me the faculty to hear confessions, there is no absolution. There's no valid absolution that's coming from my ministry, right? So. It all depends on, on the order of which the bishop, and this is how the church is structured too, in, in her hierarchy, right? You know, there's faculties that are assigned by authority. And ultimately, it is God's authority that sets everything into motion in the world. So the angels being this invisible motion, this invisible movement in the world among us, whether there's sentiment within the being or not, I think it's I think it's worthwhile to think about and pray about and theologically structure and consider because you know what else you want to think about like the you know the NFL or the you know or, yeah. I don't know like I'd rather it's I'd rather it's worth consider considering. So yeah. I think that that last topic of discussion, uh, Delacrosse touched on it. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but we did. I was talk feeling about... what you were saying, man. I was feeling what you were saying, Delacrosse, because I'm Italian. Uh... And I've got a heart. That's yeah, but it was so pretty funny. We did. I think we did touch on the the nature of Christ, both God and man, and that begs the question: Does Jesus have what? Well, did Jesus have a guardian angel? Now, if he was like us in all things except for sin, and all human beings are assigned a guardian angel, logic would say that he was ascribed a guardian angel, and he had angels ministering to him. He had angels ministering to him. Guardian or not, but I was in Gethsemane, and there is a uh, a church there, and I ha and my wife and I were on our tenth anniversary, and we went to this church where Church of All Nations. Uh, yeah, where Christ uh, entered into his suffering um, and bled uh, tears, and this is uh, before he was cap where he was captured, and I had this overwhelming like grace of of the of the presence of angels ministering to him while I was there. And I, I, mean, I, this is like the only place I was the whole trip where Jen and I were, I mean, I just wanted to sit there and, and I just didn't want to leave in the, in the overwhelming, like 
the overwhelming message to my heart was like that the, the angels were ministering to him. So I, when you brought that up, I immediately thought about that experience of prayer. Well, I think that is one of the, the classical or at least the, the commonsensical ways of viewing, did Jesus have a guardian angel? Well, obviously angels are ministering to him. Those very well could have been his guardian angels, right? Yeah. Uh, it, would, it would stand to logic that God does not need anything. But as he emptied himself to become a human being, he would allow, because, I mean, he allowed himself to be comforted, um, right. the physical yeah. comforts of yeah. many times, whether it be fed, whether it be given a place to sleep, whether it be uh, to have his face wiped by Veronica, whether it was to have his feet cleaned by uh, Mary, right? He allowed himself to be comforted because, again, he was human, but he also was giving the example of what others should do. So the logic then would say that, yes, he would have allowed himself to be assigned a guardian angel. And one of the traditions of the church is that St. Michael himself volunteered and was ascribed to be the guardian angel of our Lord. And that's why you'll see him fighting Satan in the desert during the temptation and all this. But that's one of the traditions, the pious traditions, not a official teaching is that St. Michael was the guardian angel of our Lord. And that's all, that's all coming from private revelation and, and it's not disclosed in a, in a public revelation manner. Um, and, and I think, you know, when you look at, and I love how much we're touching on the two natures of Christ, like his humanity and his divinity. And look how we could really take a step further than just kind of blanket statements, but to really to discern who Jesus is as the second person of the Holy Trinity, who Jesus is as son of God and son of Mary, you know, to, to reflect on what his humanity's need is and how his humanity is being nurtured by the authority of his parents, Joseph and Mary. We, we learned that in Luke chapter two, that he went back with Jesus and, I mean, excuse me, with Joseph and Mary and lived under their authority returning to Nazareth after he was found in the temple. So, you know, Jesus is constantly exposed to both the divinity of his nature and turning to the Father, but also living among us and, and experiencing firsthand how our humanity is cultured and nurtured toward the good. So, of course, Jesus, Jesus would reveal in his humanity humanity's assistance, which, it, which are the saints, which are the angels, which are our guardian angels. So if our humanity is assigned by God prior to the coming of Christ, a guardian angel, well, of, logically speaking, Jesus Christ would have a guardian angel. Now, what faculties that guardian angel would have, you know? I, I think he, w he would have the typical faculties of a guardian angel. Yeah. But the person of Jesus Christ and the second person of the Holy Trinity, I think, would also be assigned multiple angels, you know, where there's devotion. And I'm sure that you're going to get into this in a little bit. Shio, yeah, I'm but sure you got the, the A-team, sure. Yeah the, priest, yeah, the priest get an A-team, you know, like the priest get, a, uh, you know, a, a second guardian angel. Um, I you know, know, I thank God for that. Uh, you know, and, and there, you know, there's, there's something to say in that, I think. And, and logically speaking, I, I would be of the school that yes, Jesus totally had a guardian angel. Well, in the yeah, commentary, the I, Oh God, Ryan, please. The way I look at it is, is very much woven into the divine. And like you were just saying, um, the divinity of Jesus. And when I, when I was considering this, I was looking at the passion of God and how the passion of God is found in the fact that he is all powerful and, and, uh, sub, uh submitted himself to, uh, to the form of a slave, right? Mm. Uh, that God, that. God entered into this experience out of passion for mm. us and ultimately would lead to the cross. But in this passion, he takes on every single aspect of who it is for us to be human. And so in that aspect, I would say, you know, he didn't get the special treatment. He, we all have, you know, this humanity, and then we share in this divinity. And if we were to share in it completely, 
I would think that in his passion and entering into this, that he would enter in precisely as, as we would. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting and logical. I think that makes a lot of sense, you know? Um, But, you know, being that he, I don't know why, you know, was am I wearing something that, you know, that, no, that was a good one. And (laughs) that was excellent, excellent, bro. Considering the hypostatic union of (laughs) the natures of Jesus Christ within him, uh, he is fully man. So as fully man, it, the logic would dictate that he would have a guardian angel. Now, whether it was St. Michael or Ryan, like you said, that as being fully man in that hypostatic union, um, he would not take that special treatment, right? That makes sense too. So again, very interesting things to ponder that we, were not, we are not going to know in this life, but no. still very interesting to think about. And I think both of those concepts are equally yeah. valid to explore now father rich you touched Mine, on right yeah you can explore both that's all right now father rich you touched on a point that we wanted to make is there are some people who get two guardian angels and now there might be a lot but we are reasonably sure that priests get two guardian angels Ooh. now Father Rich, you you know this tradition. You actually first brought this up to me, and I've since looked into it and tried to find some of the, the logical basis for it. Um, what are your thoughts on it before I get into my thoughts? Well, before we get into your thoughts and before I share mine on, on two guardian angels or not, I'm just I'm thinking of Ryan Delacrosse and you know breaking the threshold of having you know multiple children. I would think that you know once you break this certain threshold of you know, having <laughs> more kids than, I don't know, like two, three, four kids. There has to be like a greater intervention, I think, in a Delacrosse house. When did you start experiencing multiple, you know, multiple <laughs> angels in your house helping you out along the way? You're, you're the biggest wackadoodle, bro. I'm telling you right now, you talk to trash. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like I got all these guardian angels, and it's not enough. For me, brother. It's, it's just not enough. I'm just jealous how many guardian angels are in your house, man. I don't well, understand why you get two. Well, at the bare now, minimum, one, there's one for him, Jen, okay? for all of his. You are jealous. One goes shopping for you at Whole Foods. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> Public ministry. Nah, man. Well, I, I, in the Delacrosse hold household, there's at least nine guardian angels because you know, with you and Jen and all the children, they all have one. So. Your house is full of guardian angels, as full as it is with children. Now, my guardian have, angels, too, both of them love going over the house and hanging out with all of y'all's guardian angels, man. It's always a big a party. It's so, a big party. I guess one of the traditions and the reasons why priest has a, priests have a second guardian angel is, number one, because they are under a different type of spiritual attack because of their nature as... Um, you know, as a priest, as a, as a, as a shepherd of Christians. So they are obviously under maybe more intense attacks, attacks than most people, but also in their consecration and in their ability to affect the transubstantiation of the Eucharist. If you look even at Eucharistic prayer, number one, where um, they say that the, the, the angel of God takes this offering up to the altar of God, you know, and sends it back down like the do fall. That is yeah. traditionally one of the justifications of a priest having a second angel, that that angel really is kind of the, um, I guess, boy. Yeah, almost like the altar boy for the, the priestly ministry that a priest is able to affect by the nature of his um, ordination. That's really cool. I definitely, I definitely feel it um, spiritually, without a doubt. I feel, I feel constant accompaniment and support in in the work and then i also want to point out that when you become a cleric and when you are ordained as a transitional deacon that's a step in the chapter of life and you feel the spiritual step at least for me i i felt the spiritual step um when i took a step as as a priest the following year it was like a step into into greater immersion of of pastoral authority and responsibility then a whole nother step when i became a pastor a step when when we started taking our ministry 
online and and you feel this immersive uh step into a whole nother arena of responsibility and ministry and that weight is is definitely you can feel it but then you also feel the accompanying forces and powers of good that are motivating you in in the direction to respond to the challenges of your office. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, Monsignor Tukes, who is the rector of, of St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary. I know Ryan Delacrosse and, 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 and Tukes have a great history. Well, now Monsignor Tukes has been elevated to be the Bishop of Beaumont, Texas. And he's been so heavy on my heart in prayer because he's assuming that next step of immersion in ministry and that type of responsibility for souls over an entire diocese is, is a heavy, it's a heavy, heavy thing. So I have to trust that when we take these steps in various stages of authority within the pastoral ministry of the priesthood, that that comes with certain favors and graces that are administered by God's mercy in different levels of angelic support and intervention. So I pray the angels over Bishop Toop's ministry, and I pray for his protection. I pray for him to be shepherded, to be guarded, to be led. And uh, and I shot him a text message. He was just he was just consecrated the other day, you know, another day ago, and ordained a bishop uh, for the glory of God. So, you know, I don't know. These are these are some of the things that I, I constantly reflect on because the more authority and responsibility that the bishops the bishop puts on me. I certainly feel it, but then I notice different types of, of interventions, and I have to assign that to angelic uh, assistance. Absolutely. And then uh, that also leads to the, the, the belief in, um, that, there, that the church, every church has its own guardian angel. Uh, communities and nations have their own guardian angels. And these would be kind of what is known as the principalities because they are assigned to a, a locational um, protectorate, whereas a guardian angel is assigned to a person. These principalities, which is the, that is their, the choir that they are in, are assigned to churches, nations, states, uh, regions, villages, uh, not to political parties, not to artificial boundaries on a map, but to a territory that God deems that one angel should, as community, protect. And you'll, you'll see this in scripture that you'll see that, uh, I think it's in the book of Daniel, they talk about the angel of Assyria, right? That was, that was to protect that area. I mean, there is biblical precedence for this, that specifically these places have angels to protect them. Pretty cool. Yeah. And when you think of angel in the sense of angelos, which you've referenced before, messenger, that we have unique messages that we receive from God's mercy to ultimately be shared to build up the mystical body of Christ in the world, that is the church. So to realize even individually, each of you that are listening in has an angelos, has a messenger, particularly and uniquely assigned to you with that unique message of salvation that your heart is receptive to in your own devotional life, in your own private revelation. That's why, you know, engaging private revelation within your own devotional life is good, but it has to be in the context of universal revelation and discerning the congruence of that and the orthodoxy of that, the, the without error, is how you receive proper spiritual direction. That's why having priests in your life or spiritual directors or, or mentors like the saints and, and regular reading of scripture will help you in your overall discernment process, whether you find yourself in the, in the throes of naming your guardian angel or not, uh, you you know, whatever, that may, whatever that may be. But, um, but no, that's, I, I think that's a really, really good point to, to consider that th this is what we as a people as nations are being given by God and, and it deserves more and more discernment and reflection. Sure. It's almost a, almost a consideration that if, you know, your guardian angel is the mailman, right? That's the person who delivers mail back and forth to you. Well, these principalities are the post offices. They're the ones that are taking the mail from this area. It's a, it's a separate charge in a unique station or a unique charge of their angelic nature, but in a, in a different type of uh, a function. 
So now two more things I want to get into before we wrap this episode up. But before we get into those, um, I want to make sure that we thank all of our patron supporters. Uh, you guys make sure that this show is able uh, to continue. You guys are, you know, in effect, our patron saints, right? There's even a tier called patron saints. I'm sorry, patron angels. Goodness me. Um, but uh, you're, you guys out there, you guys and women out there who are supporting us, we want to thank you every time uh, you make this show possible. If you want to support us on Patreon, just go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. You can go on there. You can find some easy ways to support us. We got some really cool, great gear that we're going to send to you in our gratitude. So thank you for that. I also want to mention our sponsor, Ave Maria University. Um, Father Rich is an alumni. Uh, it's an a it's an amazing school. Father Rich, why don't you give a little something about Ave Maria? Well, Ave Maria University continues to build out its core curriculum and over 30 majors. There's a doctoral programs, PhD uh, level of of, um, of academia. There are phenomenal professors and the best thing about AMU is the community and everybody's one. We all come to church together and reflect on the word of God and grow. And, and uh, you know, my memories back when the beginning days of Ave Maria University was founded in the early 2000s, you know, to be able to have that type of relationship with your professor where you could actually sit at of the lunch table in between breaks and, and have deep conversations and really learn from people who, who have studied this thoroughly and have, you know, have a doctoral expertise in this. It was really just a tremendous community and we continue to grow. I'm, I'm on conference calls all the time supporting the university. So if you're looking at universities to attend or you have children or, or grandchildren uh, that are considering a university, you know, stop considering and discerning. Look into Ave Maria University. You could not choose a better university to send your loved ones to. Absolutely. They, they have a perfect balance between excellent programs that will help you in perf your professional life and then a community that will support you in your spiritual life and keep you close to the church. Plus, they're in Florida. It's beautiful campus. It's beautiful weather. Uh, go to AveMaria.edu. Check it out. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can learn more about them. And we want to thank them for uh, supporting the show. It means a lot to us. Now, two last things I want to get into. So what happens to your guardian angel when you die? Does it just dissipate? Or you said what is there to consider? Well, what happens? Chops you off or what? I mean, right. it's still still going to be tasked with spiritual good. So, I mean, if you're not in heaven, you're in purgatory or whatever, you probably still assigned to you, huh? That's right. So if you're, if you, so when you die and if you die in a state of grace, your angel will get to be able to enjoy and enjoy the joys of heaven in eternity in peace and relaxation after its job is done for eternity at that point with the accidental goodness of being able to enjoy it with you. Now, if you go to purgatory and you're not ready and you still need purification after your death, your angel's job's not done. You just made your angel work overtime. So good job, guys. Now your angel yeah, has to pick up that second happen. job. Your angel now has to pick up that second evening job to cover you, right? Uh, which I means, do the same for Harold. <laughs> I do the same for him. Which means that um, you, do, <laughs> you do the same for yours. But that means that your angel is going to be taking your supplications and your request for grace and for um, satisfaction uh, while you're in purgatory to God. <laughs> Father Rich, you're not holding it together. <laughs> Sorry. Now, what happens to the angels? I the love guardian? you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Father Rich. <laughs> You like the name of my... Uh, I do. I'm <laughs> jealous. Carol? <laughs> you like Carol? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Our All right. So, Angel. so, so what <laughs> happened to... The Hark the Herald. <laughs> I love it, man. That would so work, Stella across. I love it, man. So what Beautiful. happens to the guardian angels of those who go to hell? Uh do they feel like they failed their job? Do they uh, get reassigned? Now, tradition teaches us that guardian angels are not reassigned, but also that... Well, according to you, they would be completely, you know, <laughs> you know, filled with apathy. They wouldn't even well, they care. Would. Actually, they would be, they'd be joyful because the justice of God has been fulfilled, right? And they are in 
the presence of God. And if God's justice is fulfilled in a person being um, sent to eternal damnation, an angel's will in serving God is perfectly aligned. So they are going to feel joy in the justice of God being fulfilled, which seems counterintuitive, like that your angel's happy that you went to hell, but your angel is happy that the will of God has been done. Which I'm sure, Father Richie, you're squirming in your shoes to refute. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just. I'm just looking at. I'm looking at greater minds because this, the thing is, this plane is landing, guys. It's landing. I'm. You're. You're. you're we not we can get... return back to the same argumentation, but we won't do that right now. We'll but say. Are you saying that your angel, that an angel, would be dissatisfied with what God desires to happen? Um, he would be counter what god's will is if he was then he's a demon if he's in full if he's in full unity with god's will if a person is sent to hell i think i think that's god's will it is the order of angels all the way at the very very threshold of of our humanity you know the investment of its being in our welfare and our order toward heaven you know if if angels were to have sentiment before god if that is a faculty that God wishes to give them, I think that would be the angelic order that does have that. But that, that whether that's the case or not, you know, I, I would just see like, yeah, I would agree. Like the archangels, those who are purely living in that beatific uh, closeness to God at the very very heights of it all. Yeah, they, they would not feel. They would be completely immersed in, in God. Well, but I mean, out of any says, of the orders, it would be the guardian angels that would that would feel. Well, Aquinas opinion. says that one of jo- one of the joys of heaven is in, is seeing the sufferings of those in hell because that the justice of God has been fulfilled, and that's that's Aquinas who you've mentioned multiple times. I think the same thing would apply to the angels who are consistently and constantly in the face of God. So that's the logic that. You know, if if you go to H E double hockey sticks, your angel isn't sitting there crying tears. Your angel is thanking God for being a just creator. Of the love or dilection of angels, question 60. And the question is whether there is natural love. On the contrary, Aquinas says, love results from knowledge, for nothing is loved except it be first known, as Augustine says in De Trinitate. But there is natural knowledge in the angels. Therefore, there is also natural love. We must necessarily place natural love in the angels. In evidence, we must bear in mind that what comes first is always sustained and what comes after. So, you know, for for me, I just think there's love within the natural order of of the world that are assigned to, assigned to especially the guardian angels. Um, And that includes includes affect. That includes affect. I, I get what you're saying, and I think that your logic is strong. I really do. But I think it's logic also... Is strong with you. I do. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I also think that an angel disagreeing with God's judgments is also counter-logical. So no, I don't know I, and I, I agree with you. I, I don't think know that's the, a fantastic argument. I really yeah. do. I, don't I know love the that answers, we're coming to the, the conclusion of this show, and we're like, look, we're finally coming back like this, and we're like, right. we're like that. We're like that. We're close. We're we're like this. We're like this. (laughs) So I think the last thing is, you know, make sure that you're praying your guardian angel prayer. Um, And also you could pray for, to the angels of others. You could pray to the Mm -hmm. guardian angels of your children. Um, Mm -hmm. Padre Pio was known a lot of times during confession, say to a, to a penitent saying, have your guardian angel talk to my guardian angel. We'll get it all worked out. Like he would say Mm -hmm. that. So, it's not that your guardian angel can only be, um, I don't know, affected by your own prayers or your concerns, but as a parent, praying for and being grateful for the protection that the guardian angels of your children provide is um, definitely something you could do. I think there's actually a prayer. It's called the, uh, let me see here. I think I have it. Oh, where is it here? I'll have my guardian angel talk to Harold later and just make sure that you're having a good time up there, Delacrosse. Yeah, have your people call, talk to my people. 
So here's a prayer uh, to the guardian angels of your children. So it's, O oh, angels of God from heaven so bright, watch beside my children to lead them aright. Fold your wings around them and guard them with love. Softly sing songs to them of hell and above. So it's, you know, a supplication that your guardian angels of your children take care of them and you're showing gratitude towards them. So I think that's another thing. So make sure you're praying to your guardian angel. Consider all these things. Now, we, we've had a lot of contrary arguments or, or concepts here, but this should be a primer for you to go out and start to discern, read, learn, and, and, and make, up, you know, make up your own mind with your own intellect and discernment on these answers. Now, a lot of these things are they're not necessary for salvation to know whether or not angels feel sadness or the exact nature of the affectivity of the emotional state of angels. They're interesting to consider, but if anything, consider your, you know, consider your guardian angel, pray to them, use them as a resource because that is what they exist for. And it's something that our world needs a lot more of people having that discernment and that guidance of the Holy spirit and then also that protection of their guardian angel to shepherd them. I think we'd be all a lot better for it. So definitely you want to start here. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Definitely checking that out. And then that's online. St. Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica. You may not want the full, the, you know, the full set of that. If you wanted the Summa of the Summa, that might be, uh, you know, it's the summary of the summary, um, you know, which is great. There we go. We got another book, Aquinas. Out of shorter focus. summa. What is that called? Shorter it's the shorter summa. summa. So it's the, yeah. yeah, it's the it, summa of the summa. This is his and own that's very, very precise helpful. version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. De Trinitate, uh, uh, um, Augustine also speaks very, very prolifically on it. You want to check some of the uh, stories of St. Faustina, of St. Padre Pio, and a number of other saints throughout history that have interacted with their guardian angels. As you spend this week reflecting on this and digging deep and letting this be a primer to your further study, uh, just know that we'll be praying to your guardian angels as well. We'll say a little prayer that God really, by the way of employing their ministry in your life, will guard your lives, will guide and shepherd your study, and most importantly, enlighten and share light upon your intellect so that you can grow before God, perceiving heaven, perceiving what is good, virtuous, and holy, and pursuing that wholeheartedly with your will. And Aquinas goes into greater uh, depth on will as it relates to angels too, which I highly recommend. We want to thank you again for journeying with us here at the Catholic Talk Show. A big shout out goes to our patrons. Thank you for supporting the show. Again, consider becoming a patron today by going to patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show or going to our website, catholictalkshow.com. There you'll see every way that you could support us. And we thank you for keeping the comments charitable. On every feed that you go on, continue to build up the body of Christ. And we will continue to open our hearts, growing together in our faith and our devotion, learning more from the Father sitting at the feet of his Son, Jesus Christ. We'll see you next week. God bless. Mm -hmm.